Thanks, everyone, for coming. And um, uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome all of you. And particularly, I'd like to welcome the CEOs of two of Spain's most exciting startups. Now, the topic of today is challenges and solutions to scale your startup. Now, that's like, that can encompass just about everything, right? Um, but on the other hand, I think we're in quite, it's quite an unusual situation in that there are some big live issues at the moment uh, that I think everyone is thinking about, right? And so I'm hoping we can have quite a focused conversation uh, and learn from your experiences uh, on topics, on challenges, and on opportunities that will impact everyone in this room, regardless of whether you're an investor or an entrepreneur or wherever you sit in the tech ecosystem. So. Why don't we start with some introductions. Uh, Manu, why don't you start? Why don't you tell us about yourself and a little bit about your company? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. This has been a pleasure. Um, we are Eidhoven. Uh, it's a strange company because uh, I'm the founder, one of the co-founders. I'm a cardiologist, now being a CEO. But my background was at the hospital dealing with patients. And uh, we, we were doing research with my co-founder. He's a telecom telecommunication engineer. He was doing his PhD on machine learning applied to cardiology. And we were able to automate uh, some tasks that are done by cardiologists analyzing electrocardiograms. And that was the idea. Like Today, thousands of doctors are dealing with these analysis, signal processing of the ECG, how the heartbeats are going on, um, and other many technologies are doing signal processing through technology, not through humans, not through cardiologists, which is a human really difficult to get, like six years of studies, five years of specialty. So it was like, can we build a machine that is able to process that in an automated, scalable, and easy way? And can we sell that and integrate this kind of product in the healthcare ecosystem? And and, and how far have you got? Tell us about where, where you are today and tell us a little bit about your funding journey as well, just so people understand the context. Yeah. So uh, we were three uh, in 2018. Now we are 25, uh, a team of 25. 15 of them are full-time employees. Uh, we have been able to raise money to finance the, the project. As it, there is a deep tech and scientific background, so we were able to raise grants Mm. Some of them, um, first company in health tech in, in Spain with CDTI, Neotech, it was 250,000 euros at the beginning. Money from Google Cloud also at the beginning, it was really helpful. Uh, 1, 100,000 euros, uh, dollars from Google Cloud, and then big grants, like 14 million grants from Horizon 2020, the European Commission, then 6.5 million grants from uh, also the European Commission, the AIC, AIC Accelerator, just 99 companies in Europe were able to raise this money. And, and do then you have financial investors as well, VCs? Also VCs. Right. We were able to raise uh, money from private VCs uh, uh, a seed round uh, a year ago. And then uh, good news are coming. Great. <laughs> OK, well, I look forward to picking up on some of the points you've already raised. But before I do, Jorge, quickly, tell us about yourself and your company. Thank you, and um, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Jorge. I'm uh, the f one of the uh, founders and CEO of Tiny Bird. Um, Tiny Bird is um, a platform for developers to build data products uh, at scale. Um, if you want to, just to simplify it uh, very quickly, you probably know products like BigQuery or uh, Snowflake. You can think of Tiny Bird as a snowflake for developers, like designed to build things and applications on top at scale, um, because the way basically we think about this is, and we had experienced this in, in our previous companies, is that the rate that data grows, um, you can't, uh, it's very difficult to keep up, especially if you want to react quickly to opportunities and problems and, and, uh, and to leverage the data as it happens. And um, also, it, nowadays, companies are building armies of data engineers just to deal with that load. And, um, and we believe that uh, the value really starts with the developers when they actually build something with that data and put it out uh, in the world. So we're trying to empower developers to build these data products. Great. Yeah. Where have you got to? How much have you raised? We, uh, have, we're 50 people in the company right yeah. now in three years. We have raised 
37 million uh, Series A uh, in the March this year. March this year. Wow, that seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the funding landscape. It seems to be top of everyone's mind. Is it top of everyone's mind, the funding landscape? Y Combinator? Does it, do these terms mean anything to anyone in this room? Sequoia? Everyone's panicking. No, everyone seems very calm. Yeah, we have a cardiologist, nice. so um, if anyone does start to panic, just raise <laughs> your hand. Um, look, I think it's important that we, that we address this, right? Everyone's seeing what's going on in the macroeconomic environment and geopolitical environment. We're seeing the impact that's having on the public markets. We're hearing a lot about the impact it's having on the private markets. We're hearing stories of down rounds. We're having, hearing stories of rounds being cancelled. Uh, we're having, we, I'm certainly, I've seen examples of companies shifting, having to shift very radically from growth at all costs to capital preservation to showing a path to profitability, so on and so forth. I'd love to know if this is what you're seeing or if you're seeing something different and if this is having any impact on your decision making. Um, do you want to start? Do you want to start? Go on. Go on, go on. I'll go, okay. Um, so, I, well, it definitely has. Like we raced at the perfect moment in the sense that, um, you know, we were procrastinating a little bit at the end of the year, whether we were going to race or not going to race. And then we started with the discussions and then Ukraine uh, uh, happened and then the markets started to uh, take a tumble and so on. And then basically our investors were like, hey, hurry up. We either close this now or you might lose the opportunity. So, um, so uh, you know, we raced and, we, you know, we're very happy to raise in the moment we did, because now it gives us like a really... Uh... Okay, so that's great. So you raise, you raise this at the right time. Congratulations. But when you think about your business plan, right, the, the plan that you raised the money on the back of, presumably it was like invest, 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 grow, 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 hockey stick, hockey stick. Exactly. Is that still your business plan? No. Uh, th th this was the plan and this is what we were trying to uh, go for. But the reality, now we've changed the plan such that we are going to continue with what he had in mind for this year because we think there's um, a lot of things going on and, and the, in our market in what we're trying to do and it makes sense to speed up now but we are planning such that um, if by the end of this year we see that you know we're heading into the uh, nuclear winter that some people are saying that it's coming we can <coughs> dial a sort of uh, investment down and still you know, uh, uh, ensure survival for, for a couple of years. So you're going to fire a whole bunch of people? Um, we're not going to fire anyone uh, for now. <laughs> we are, we're trying to, we are uh, hiring just to the point where if at the end of this year we wanted to stop, we would be a very, in a very good place to continue to right. grow, to continue to build and find, uh, uh, you know, customers and so on, but not in this crazy, I'm not caring about margin, uh, gross margins, Type of way. Got it, got it. And what about you, Manu? You're saying, hey, we're doctors here. This is, this is, this is, we're in a different world. This is real, real stuff. We're saving people's lives. We're not, we're not one of those like little startups, bits around. crazy you know, Web3 stuff. Is that right? Is that your message now? Well, the, the way we, indeed we are, we are supposed to uh, risk every day when you are a doctor. And if you are a cardiologist, you are dealing with a heart attack. It can kill you in, in 20 minutes. So uh, the way I, I see it, and it's a personal perspective, the way to approach when there is too much noise out there and too much fear is to just relax and, and think. Right. So uh, how is it? The, the money is already there. They, last year, they, the, all the LPs, they, they, they have never raised so ma much money, or like many VCs raising a lot of money. So the money is there, and they have to invest this money. So that, that's, for me, this is clear, and there are some data about that. Um, <coughs> how are they going to invest, and how do you think you, you should be and act and, and do the plan as a startup uh, based on, on what, where are they going to invest? I think they are going to be betting and investing on the, those companies that are performing well. Yeah. So you have to focus on execution, on get the right metrics, right assumptions, validating the hypothesis with a lower amount of money that is able to demonstrate that this experiment, this hypothesis that is in your head, like I'm able to sell this way to this kind of client through that channel, and I'm going to demonstrate that with a, this amount of money, and then if you are able to validate that and you are able to get those metrics, I think those companies will be able to raise the money they need 
because those uh, funds are going to to invest on the ones that are where they are reducing the risk. When the, the money is afraid, yeah. they, they try to invest on those companies where the risk is lower. So I'm. So no, I, I mean I think I think that that must be right, mustn't it? I, it feels like uh, you know this is where quality is really going to come to the fore, mm. uh, where everyone is going to st start to ask perhaps more questions, yeah. uh, both on the investment side and uh, on the entrepreneurial side, um, and be more thoughtful um, and look at you know the metrics that frankly some people have, have forgotten about as being absolutely critical. Just talking a little bit on that theme about scaling and about scaling effectively, I know both of your companies have been involved with Google for Startups right from the outset and have built your stack on Google Cloud Platform. What was your thinking behind that and how would you sort of characterize your, the benefits of, of, of being involved um, with, with Google given where you are in your, in your journey? Um, for us, um, we, we first chose Google as a technology, as in we came from another startup and uh, we actually preferred Google Cloud to AWS Cloud. It had given us much less trouble when uh, scaling and so on. So in this new startup, we said, let's start with Google because we had sort of already made that choice in the previous company. Um, then we, uh, we were just five of us. We went to work at Google Campus, which is great. Like uh, uh, to be suddenly you don't start like a, you know the old garage thing. It's a very nice uh, story, but it's actually much nicer to work in a place where there's other people that are going through the same things that you're going through. So that was the community and, and aspect of that was great. Obviously, the Google for Startups program with putting money like that was like free, like a, the best. Um, but the kind of money you need when mm. you're starting, especially a technology company, that was key for us in order to uh, convince some initial customers and not being worried about uh, having to invoice them every month and all of these things. Um, and then the network as well, like it, it was like through Sophia in, in Google Campus, you know, she opened a lot of doors for us in terms of companies to speak to uh, and uh, people within Google to ask questions to. So that was, it, it's like having like a, like a rich, wise, Parent, uh, you know, so uh, it, was, uh, it was. Actually, I wouldn't know, but that sounds great. <laughs> um, Manu, what about you? Similar sort of experience? Yeah, uh, for us it was great. Like at the beginning, you were the one helping us when you are alone. Like uh, mm -hmm. Sophia giving us an office at Google Campus. I think this was great. Uh, we were asking for credits on cloud, and and you were telling us like two thousand, twenty thousand euros, and it was like. We, we can do nothing with 20,000 mm. because it was yeah. a lot of computing uh, stuff. And so you were giving us the same amount of money that you were giving to mm. uh, US universities. And, and it was just two founders, three founders uh, doing uh, right. with the plan. Um, and then once the project evolves, uh, we are a highly regulated market like healthcare, cloud solutions. Mm. We are hardware agnostic. So our software is a digital cardiologist that is living in the cloud analyzing data from different hospitals, different countries. Uh, so in such a regulated market, having a, a cloud architecture that is everywhere, uh, that is compliant as far as all the ISO norms, all the, all the infrastructure um, that is able to integrate with different servers uh, from different data protection agreements, I think this is really, really, really important Cool, cloud provider. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. Um, I want to move on. We haven't got a lot of time. There's so many issues that are top of everyone's mind. I want to come on to the sort of post-pandemic landscape and specifically around workplace uh, dynamics. Um, you know, clearly the pandemic has accelerated a trend which was kind of already there. Um, but it's really supercharged that trend towards sort of, you know, hybrid or sometimes fully remote working. Um, what, are you, what are you seeing, um, both within your companies, but more broadly, what are some of the challenges that, that uh, and of course opportunities, that the new working uh, landscape presents? Jorge. Um, I mean, opportunities, I think, um, you know, working remotely, I think, always, ha before the pandemic, always had the advantage from my point of view of, hey, you're opening yourself up to hiring people anywhere, and so your pool is much bigger, and you can find uh, people, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
and I used to be like a big defender of remote work. Not now, not so much. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's not, it's not that I, I mean, we work remotely and, and we're, we're used to it, but actually, you know. Um, Hang on, let, let, let's be specific. So, uh, how many of you are there? 50. And on any given day, how many of those people will be in one place at the same time? Mm, zero. Oh, right. And yeah. has that always been the case? The, yeah, well, we started in Google Campus like oh, you seven the months pandemic. before the pandemic. But you haven't been tempted to, to sort of revert it to a more traditional model? Uh, we, ha we talk about it. I don't think we will do it. We, we now have an office in Madrid sometimes uh, where people can go. I meet my co-founders there maybe once a week. Um, but the reality is that it's very difficult. You're either remote and then everything is online and everything you write, people can read and all of that stuff. But when you go into a sort of a hybrid model, then you're leaving a lot of people out of certain discussions. You, you know, yeah. so it's not that easy. Um, and to me, the problem is not so much about what Elon Musk says. You know that you know people can go uh, procrastinate. Or I don't know yeah. how he put yeah. it, like just on, it, on someone else's time kind of thing. Um, it's more about the culture. Like when you're a startup, um, you want to make sure that the people you hire work in a certain way. Feel you know sure. have an attitude and a, you know that. Uh, is right to what you want to do and so what's so on. next are you going to build a building in central madrid and fill it up with that that's the thing I, we haven't figured it out yet right. but but the problem is it's very difficult you know people learn what they see and if they're not seeing you it's you know it's very difficult to uh, the culture make sure that it evolves you know without a physical presence so that's what i miss and we we haven't figured out how to solve this uh, in a way and it's a source of frustration because we see hey, we should be maybe doing more teaching, right. more speaking. So you're trying to figure this yeah. out. So Manu, tell Jorge the answer. What's the answer here? <laughs> I don't know if we have the answer. Uh, what we are doing now, um, it's three times a week at the office, uh, Monday and Friday. You can do, be everywhere mm -hmm. because people like that, like they are traveling and sometimes and, and they are working on Friday from another place and then spending the weekend on that place. So we are quite hippie on that. And then if you don't want to come to the office, you don't have to come. If it's uh, a powder day, like snowfall, biggest snowfall and the sun rising, you can cancel all the meetings and you can go because right. we are creating And that's working that. out for you? Sorry? And that's working out? This, this it's working. Model? Like for me, the, the key point about remote, non-remote, it's uh, we, we are leading through productivity. So for me, how to build a great team. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for me, the company is the team the tech, the product, and the business. And you have to revisit all of those four columns uh, like every month. So how is the team going? And to build a great team, that is the one that is going to perform the other things there, uh, you have to be friends. You have to be able to drink beer sometimes together. You have to be able to have fun. And you have to be able also to argue sometimes. And remote, sometimes it's not so easy to argue in a human way. So mm. that's why we're trying to do an hybrid thing. But then we are hiring people that is not living in Spain. So right, I want to come on to that. Okay, so here's obviously a massive opportunity and also potentially a massive threat that in any kind of hybrid model, it kind of totally expands the geographical range that we're, you can hire from, right? But that also applies to your competitors and it particularly applies to the big multinationals. So how are you seeing this play into the kind of the war for talent, if I can put it that way, in particular technology talent? I, I, it's difficult. Um, suddenly, uh, Meta is coming here building you know, a big uh, development center for engineers and so on. Uh, lots of companies, Eventbrite, Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, Google as well. You know, so it's, it, it's very difficult you compete with those guys. Um, and at the same time, uh, I think the advantages are I think if you have an exciting uh, startup uh, in in Spain and people, um, that's not that hasn't been the case for many years. I mean, there's been really yeah. good startups, but it hasn't been um, a massive amount of them. I think engineers and and in, in general people like those examples and they see it as an opportunity to come to work for a small company and learn how that's done. And that's I think an advantage at at this stage where you're sort of a Series A. Or, um, or so, so that, that's something we, we see a lot. People want to come and be part of something that's born here and it's going international. Right. Um, uh, but obviously you have to be very competitive and you have to find the angles to compete with, with the multinationals. And the, one of the problems is salaries are racing across right. the board because 
you know, um, one thing is to say, hey, I'm very excited about this startup. Another thing is like, hey, Amazon's going to pay me double what you're paying me. You know, it's, a, it's, not, it's not that easy. So let's say you want to hire somebody in a low-cost jurisdiction. Uh, are you going to pay them Madrid salaries or are you going to pay them local salaries? So what we've done, it, we have a sort of salary, we've created um, salary bands that start in the U.S. based on U.S. salaries. And then we've made um, an adaptation uh, like sort of a percentual adaptation if you're in the UK or in Spain, which right. is what we're doing. But, you know, the, some, it, it still generates friction of, hey, I'm doing the same job and this person is winning more money. And the answer to that is, you know, we understand. If you want to move to the US, yeah. we're very happy Got to it. pay you the same salary if you move over there. Because the reality is, you know, you have to find a balance uh, somewhere. Manu, what about you? Uh, I think your team is sort of a bit smaller. Yep. Um, clearly, hiring is going to be a, and is a key challenge for you, like everyone else. How are you seeing the, the new world of work playing into uh, you know, your challenges around, around hiring and retaining your, your talent? For me, the, the competition is, is global. Like, and we have some examples that we were doing the offer and all the companies uh, just saying, I'm going to double the salary. Like company from Switzerland to a, a, a smart guy, we were doing the offer and he was telling us, I cannot come because they just doubled the offer. And so you, you don't have, I think my perspective is, you need to have kind of a budget and a, a, and a structure and a mindset on how are you paying uh, all the team members and about salaries. And then if things like that happen, you should not go for it because uh, just double because of uh, it's another company from another country. You cannot do that because at scale it doesn't work. And if you don't understand why you are doing the things you are doing, then you are going to have prob troubles to explain to the whole team uh, what's going on with it. Yeah, we, we don't make exceptions. No. Yeah. I mean, this is, these are the bands. The, this is where you fit in. Do you agree that you fit in this band based on what we, you're expected to do? Yes then this is a salary, and then, um, you, you know, if you, you have a better offer, there's nothing much we can do. That has forced us to, you know, raise the bands yeah. at some point and bring everybody up, but we prefer that. that you know, the, the alternative is internal, you know, it doesn't make, it's just not fair, and we're not comfortable with it, so. Got it. Look, this is absolutely fascinating. I hope, I hope some of this, all of this has been interesting for people in, uh, in the audience. Each one of these topics you know, frankly, we've barely scratched the surface. I'm conscious we've only got two minutes left. The one thing we haven't talked about is Web3, uh, which apparently is a thing, and everyone's talking about it. And uh, uh, so I I'm just going to spring it on you guys. Apparently, it's changing everything. It's changing the rules of business. It's changing the world. Uh, uh, at least that's what my 14-year-old boy tells me. Jorge, you've got a minute. Actually, you've got 30 seconds. Give me a high-level reaction My, um, to the new, the, the, the new technologies and the extent to which you care, you understand, it's going to impact your business. Um, I, I specifically on Web3, um, <laughs> I, my 30-second answer is I'm either too old or it's all bullshit. But that's just me, so I, I haven't really um, I looked into it in a lot of detail. Um, so you shouldn't take it from me. You should make your own opinion. Got it. I, I, there's, uh, there's a lot of wisdom in what you've just said. Um, Manu? Also a difficult one. Uh, I don't like to talk about things I don't know. <laughs> so if I'm not an expert, I try not to give an answer. So it's going to be no answer. What I know from, from technology and from science is that um, the world is continuously evolving. And what I have learned from all the papers and all the, like, we, our name is Eindhoven because we come from Willem Eindhoven. Eindhoven was the inventor of the father of the electrocardiogram in uh, 1903. Um, and the electrocardiogram has saved thousands of lives. And now we are building AI on top of this kind of technology, which is he was able to record the cardiac rhythm, electrical rhythm, mm. and, and we are building AI on top of that. So many things can happen. Technology and knowledge is like this. Once knowledge advance, then there, there is not a way to come back, like the knowledge stays for the generations to come. So I'm looking forward for it. Great. We've got 15 seconds. Just enough time to thank our panel. That was absolutely fascinating. Really, really appreciate you, uh, talking to you and learning from you. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you very much.